welcome to the Grassroots Series 2021. My name is Ben Lee, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Invertigro, an Australian startup which is building the next generation of rapidly scalable plug-and-play indoor farming solutions. Today, I'm here to speak about financing your startup and to share with you some of our experiences. One of the key focus points of all startup journeys is the need for capital to fund the development of your idea or product to a phase where it is ready to be tested more broadly by testers or your target customers in order to bring it to market. Obviously, every startup is different in terms of their development phase. However, a universal truth is that as a founder or co-founder, your main challenge is to have enough cash in the bank to ensure a smooth product development path. Now, this is easier said than done. There are a number of different pathways you can take, and often it's one or a combination of a few different approaches, each with their own pros and cons. So let's start with bootstrapping. What is bootstrapping? Bootstrapping is building a company from the ground up with nothing but personal savings and with luck, the cash coming in from the first sales. Some of the best known brands such as Apple, GitHub, and Spanx are known to be examples of companies that have bootstrapped. While this is one of the most preferable options when building a company, since the founder or co-founders retain complete control, it takes an immense amount of discipline to have the right combination of confidence, risk tolerance, determination, and competitiveness. Also, Depending on the type of product you're building, it may not be the best approach if your product is driven by market forces and demand, which may benefit from external investors bringing resources such as capital and connections to accelerate your path to market. If this is not the case, then bootstrapping allows business owners to experiment more with the brand as there is no pressure from investors to get the product right the first time. By using a collection of methods to minimize the amount of outside debt and equity financing needed from banks and investors, companies that are bootstrapping will look at owner financing, personal debt, sweat equity, operating and keeping your operating costs as low as possible. Another option is to look at subsidy finance, which is government cash payments or tax reductions. And finally, using revenues which is cash to run the business coming from your sales. A bootstrap company usually grows through three funding stages. One, the beginning stage. Two, the customer funded stage. And three, potentially the credit stage. For new companies, bootstrapping might be an effective model because it encourages simplicity and flexibility during the early growth phase. But there may be another kind of pressure though, especially if you are risking your personal and maybe family assets and putting those on the line. Another downside to bootstrapping can be a lack of credibility. The backing of respected investors can automatically give businesses a higher visibility and greater respect from vendors and customers. Now, having spoken to a few companies who have gone through bootstrapping, the advice is to do as much as you can yourself to minimize your costs and to get customer validation as fast as possible to be able to start paid trials. And one of the most important things, if you have your own or family assets on the line, is not to throw good money after bad. There are a number of resources and pointers on bootstrapping available on the internet. But speak to other founders who have been through the journey. As a founder myself and with the network of other entrepreneurs, most of us have started through bootstrapping at some point you may find that you need additional capital beyond what you can afford or have the capacity to manage. However, before you jump straight to investors for funding options, there are other options that are available that, is, that the government has provided. In Australia, we are extremely lucky to have the R&D tax incentive in place. So what is the R&D tax incentive? A surprising amount of businesses in Australia are doing research and development. They just don't realize it. As a result, in order to encourage innovation, 
the Australian government is providing a tax incentive for small businesses that are taking a financial risk in creating something new or making improvements to something existing. From a startup perspective, especially if you are pre-revenue, this tax incentive is equal to 43.5 cents for each dollar spent on R&D. If the tax offset exceeds your company's tax liability, the balance is paid in cash, which is really helpful if your product is capital intensive, especially in product development. But be aware that this benefit is accompanied by a rigorous, rigorous regulatory regime and in recent years has attracted more scrutiny and increased review activity by the ATO and Oz industry. It is your duty to focus on thorough eligibility assessment and the substantiation of claims. And so, first, consider if what you're doing qualifies as R&D. It's generally accepted that you're doing research and development if you're experimenting with different solutions to solve a previously unsolved problem. The first port of call to determine if you're eligible is to visit the ATO website. They also have a hotline or a web service to contact and are very helpful in answering any questions that you may have. There are also a number of individuals and businesses which offer advice and assistance on the R&D tax incentive, usually for a percentage of the offset or rebate amount or a fixed fee. Additionally, depending on the amount that you are spending on R&D, there are financing options available that provide advanced loans based on your projected spend. But do take note that the interest component that these institutions charge for access to this funding can be quite high. Another option is looking at government grants. Now, grants are one of the most useful resources of funding available. Grants typically assist with the funding and support of specific projects within a business and each grant is designed to fund a specific purpose, so it is important that it aligns with your business needs. There are a number of resources that provide grants such as industry bodies, local government entities, such as suburban or city councils, where smaller chunks of money are usually available, at the state level and at the federal level. To receive a grant, you'll have to go through an application process Generally, you'll need to ensure that you meet the eligibility criteria and know exactly what you're applying for and why to complete the grant application. This process varies in time and detail, depending on what you're applying for. There are a large number of resources to ensure that you are aware of each grant. There are also a large number of fee-based services or consultants that can help you with your grant writing process. But the important thing here is to note that you know your business best and are able to tell the story most clearly. So it is advisable that you take the time for the first few grant applications and get comfortable and familiar with the format and language that is used. From here, you can build a database of template responses, which can be used and adapted for future applications. However, it is also important to note that there are some services that can add value in the grant application process. So it's a matter for you to decide what works best for you. Again, do your due diligence before committing and always wear your negotiation cap when it comes to discussing the fees. Here are a few tips in approaching grant monies. In writing your grant application, you need to be clear, concise, and compelling. Remember that the money is given for solutions and not problems. Take some time to research the funding body first, including past successful applicants, and understand the priorities of the funding body and align their priorities with yours. Make a grants checklist to identify the relevant grants, and from there you can develop your strategy which will include the priority based on the alignment of values with the funding entity, the timing required to complete the application, developing an appropriate project plan, and most importantly, highlight the keywords and expand on these said keywords, which will show clearly what the grant awarding body want to see in an answer. Next up, 
we can look at crowdfunding. Now, this isn't a space which I'm too familiar with, but I do know of some companies which have used them to great success. These platforms are generally more suitable for a B2C type product. Crowdfunding platform fit is as important to the success of a crowdfunding campaign as it is learning how to convert fans into backers. If you're on the wrong platform, you won't reach the people most likely to back your project. Now, there are a number of different platforms out there, with each with a tailored focus based on the product or offering that you have. Some of these include GoFundMe, Everyday Hero, Kickstarter, and Circle Up. Again, research is a key element to identifying the right platform for you. Next, I'd like to talk a bit about angel investment, which is the most common type of fundraise which most startups who seek capital will raise through initially. Very often, you'll find your initial angel investors amongst your network of friends and family. So when entering into this type of transaction, it is advisable for all parties to be really clear about the risks that are involved in early stage investing, especially if these angel investors are close to you or new to the investing landscape. So for you to manage their expectations is paramount. Now, typically these investors will invest between $10,000 and $100,000. There are also external networks of angel investors available, which are often accessed through warm introductions from trusted parties. For example, another fellow entrepreneur that they know, your legal representative, another angel investor, or a venture capital entity. At Invertigo, we have had some great introductions through a VC group following a due diligence process, which then fast tracked our entry into an angel investment group. As always, there are different angel groups who focus on different investment theses. Some focus on energy investments, some on social deliverables, and others on a com combination. It is advisable to understand what the different angels are looking to invest in and find the closest fit so you are able to adhere to their desired outcomes through your overall business offering, and you're not constantly changing your narrative. Angel investors are also a great resource to have. Once they have committed to an investment, it is because they believe in you and the team that you have, and they also want to see the investment grow. It's not through altruism. So don't be shy to ask for help. It can be introductions to resources you may need, potential customers you've identified, advice, or even just a sounding board. When approaching angel investors, ensure that you have all your documentation up to date and ready. A few founders that I've spoken to in the past, or some which have sent me material for review, make the mistake in thinking that just because it's someone you know or are friendly with, that there will be leniency in the documentation that is provided. Approach every investor, be it your mother or your best friend, as you would a venture capital or an institutional investor. They will really appreciate your professionalism and it helps to maintain some segregation between the personal and investor relationship that you may have with them. Finally, the holy grail for a number of startups is winning VC funding. The process with venture capital groups can be challenging, but also very rewarding. Almost all the interaction we have had with VCs are through warm introductions. Peter Hyun from Qualgro will be speaking more in depth on the topic of VCs. But as an entrepreneur and from the advice and experience I've had with Invertigo, it is imperative that you do your homework and understand the investment theses of these VCs that you want to approach. Even more importantly, is to look at their portfolio companies and understand how the VC, VCs have helped with resourcing those portfolio companies, at, as this could be a huge asset in addition to the capital that they bring. So that was an overview of the different funding options available as a startup. There are a number of ways to access these different pools of capital through research, 
word of mouth, introductions, accelerator programs, and purely through the power of the ask. Invertigrow is experienced through Cicada's Grow Lab and the int introductions made have been invaluable, as well as the willingness of the other residents in the incubator community to help. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Ben Lee, co-founder and CEO of Invertigrow for the Evoke Ag Grassroots Series. Hi folks, my name is Peter Huynh and uh, I'm a partner at uh, a VC firm called Qualgrow based in Singapore. And today I'm delighted to have the opportunity to take you through um, a short workshop on capital raising and it's for the Grassroots Series. Let me uh, tell you a little bit more about the agenda and then a little bit about myself and we'll then dive straight into it. So today I'd like to give you an overview and walk you through some of the fundamentals of you know, how venture capital actually works and to give you the perspective, not only from a founder's perspective, raising capital, but also from the investor's side so that you can uh, get a chance to, to see how investors may be assessing your company for potential investment. So first of all, how does venture capital work? How does the system work? Then what is the VC investment process? What are the steps in that process? Because it, it actually can be quite a, a lengthy process, uh, particularly for those who've never, never been through it before. Um, and I'm going to take you through some useful documents for capital raising and the things that you should consider preparing uh, as you start your capital raise. And then lastly, just some thoughts and, and tips on my side, having seen quite a few of these capital raises over time. So that's the agenda for the session today. And a little bit more uh, context about myself. I'm partner and co-founder of a VC firm called Qualgrow. Qualgrow stands for quality and growth. It's a type of name that you come up with for a uh, new venture capital firm when you're a bunch of ex-consultants <laughs> trying to figure out a, a name. Um, so Qualgrow is based in Singapore. Um, our first fund was 50 million. Our current fund is 100 million. And um, we invest across Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand in uh, quite a specific space. It's B2B SaaS data AI. They're the areas that we uh, invest in. And we invest in a life cycle stage known as series A and series B. And I'll tell you a bit more about what that means as a part of this presentation. I've also been a part of Startmate since the SM13 cohort. So 2013, 2012, 2013, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm a part of um, the Accelerated, also the uh, fellowship um, program. And I've been involved in the selection process for that program. And I've been a mindfulness teacher now for oh, uh, well over 10 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I've been teaching meditation to um, small groups uh, and also to a, um, a number of founders each year. Uh, just to um, uh, help to build uh, resilience. And it's part of my uh, work just to help to build leadership and, and self-awareness amongst our community. Um, I was previously at uh, Singtel Group and I was a director uh, at a fund called Singtel Innovate, which is a, um, a corporate venture capital fund uh, run by the Singtel Group and in Australia it was known as Optus Innovate. So uh, enough about <laughs> me, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of perspective. Let's, let's dive into it then. Um, uh, and what I'd like to start um, by doing is just giving you an overview of how venture capital actually works, the system, you know, what actually happens. So imagine that, um, you know, you're a, uh, a venture capitalist, okay? Uh, venture capitalists raise money from um, essentially, you know, private investors of, of, some, uh, of some form. They could be pension funds, they could be uh, university endowment funds, they could be charitable foundations, family offices, large corporations even. Uh, and so, you know, uh, as an example, for Qualgrow, our first fund was mostly made up of uh, investors from large corporations. They were the main investors in our fund. And in our current fund, our second fund, uh, most of our, I mean, we have investors from uh, uh, more sources, you know, we have uh, institutional investors, you know, uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, uh, as well as large corporations. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, many different funds have different sources of capital uh, and it will range, but it's typically in this group that is uh, in the box below on this chart. And now those venture capitalists will then, you know, invest in startups, the box to the top left there. 
And um, startups can raise from venture capitalists, of course, but they can also uh, raise from, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can, you can see the orange box there, they can raise from angel investors, corporations, sometimes there are government grants, and um, uh, you're probably seeing a, uh, some uh, alternative sources of funding at the moment, such as forms of invoice fin financing and other types of debt financing for, for startups. So startups don't have to raise from venture capitalists. There are other sources as well, but the most well-known uh, and most common source at the moment you know, certainly are uh, venture capitalists. But you know, uh, I, I just want to reiterate that it's not the only source. There are other possible avenues of funding as well. And so uh, venture capitalists, you know, invest in startups and essentially they're investing for some type of shareholding, whether immediately or subsequently uh, uh, in that startup, right? They have, they've bought some shares in that startup. Uh, okay, now, uh, how does the venture capitalist make money? Well, they make money in only a few key ways. Firstly, is when that startup uh, grows large enough to IPO on some type of stock market. And in that event, an investment banker is involved because they help to facilitate that um, IPO to happen, right? That listing to occur. Um, the other way, and once that happens, by the way, the um, venture capitalists can then choose to, if they want to, sell their shares, the shares that they own, onto the stock market and make their money in that way. The other way that um, uh, venture capitalists make money is if that startup is bought by another company. Usually it's a larger company. And that, that process is often facilitated as well by investment bankers, this box on the top right. Okay, and in that event, if a, a large company is buying a startup, uh, they're buying all of the shares essentially in that company, including the shares that are owned by the venture capitalist firm. Okay, uh, now the third way that a venture capitalist can make money is that they sell their shares in the company, even when the company is still private before it has listed. And you know, they're selling only their shares in the company. And this is called a secondary sale. And so they can sell to you know, another party, but that, that type of sale tends to need to be approved by the board of that company because it's still a private company. So they need to approve who you're selling it to. Uh, you can't sell it to a competitor, for example. Um, and usually the price, there's some type of discount on the um, valuation of the company, a slight discount. Usually it's somewhere in the order of 10 to 20% or so. Okay, so these are the ways that venture capitalists make money. They invest when a company is small, help that company to grow, therefore growing the value of their shareholding. And at some point in time, there is an exit in the form of an IPO, uh, an acquisition or some form of secondary sale. They're the ways that, um, that VCs make money. So hopefully that gives you a, an overview or a sense of um, you know, what happens within a VC firm and how they make money in every other scenario uh, the venture capitalists will not make money, right? <laughs> and so uh, therefore, you know, it's, it's seen as a relatively high risk um, uh, uh, asset class because of course we all know that the, um, uh, the rate of failure for startups is relatively high. All right, now uh, let me take you through the, uh, uh, the ways that a fund is structured. So you imagine, you know, a venture capital firm They'll have multiple funds. Our, fund, our uh, firm has two funds, uh, the first one and the second one. And th these are some uh, indicative terms. So our current fund, the fund size, let's say uh, is 100 million. Um, funds have fund durations. So you have the start of the fund and the end of the fund. So by the end of the fund, uh, the VC firm closes that fund, returns, uh, sells off all of their shareholdings, uh, along the way, there might have been some IPOs, there might have been some uh, acquisitions, uh, and, at the, and they might have sold some other shares through secondaries. But by the end of the fund, all of that has to be sold. With whatever has been uh, collected, the initial capital from the uh, investors has to be returned first. So that $100 million has to be returned first. And out of the profit, the, um, the VC firm will keep, the partners will keep 20% of the profits and return 80% of those profits on a pro rata basis to all the investors in the fund. And that 20% profit that they keep is called carried interest. And you can see it uh, here on the table there. So most funds run according to what's known as a two and 20, 
which means that 2% of the fund is used to run the fund for due diligence, for travel, for staff, you know, all the sort of uh, salary costs, all those sorts of things, systems, software, you know, all those sort of things. And so 2% of the fund is used to run the fund on an annual basis. And if the fund runs for 10 years, that's 2% for 10 years, which is 20%, right, of the fund is used to run the fund, okay? The carried interest is the amount of um, profit that the partners keep of any profit that is made from selling all of the shares and all of the investments that they've made over that 10 year period. Now, what's interesting to note is if the fund size is 100 million and you're taking out 2% each year for 10 years, right, which is basically 20% of the fund, that means that the amount of capital that the uh, fund will actually deploy is not 100 million, it's actually 80 million, right? You've spent 20 million running the fund over 10 years. So out of that 80 million, you have to be able to return at least 100 million plus whatever profit there may be. And, uh, and most venture firms target what's known as a 3x return over that 10-year um, period. Okay. Uh, I know that this might be a, a little bit confusing, but hopefully that gives you a sense. I want to give you a sense of how these funds are actually run and, and what the incentives are on the investor side. Um, and so um, some other aspects to note are that the fund typically has what's known as a fund close. And so the clock starts once that fund closes, right? Uh, and um, the fund, most funds, in fact, all funds have what's known as an investment period. And the investment period is basically the period in which the fund has to make its investments um, in various companies right? It's first investments in those companies. And for our fund, we have an investment period of four years. So from the date of the, of the, of the close to, um, you know, when we can no longer make new investments, it's four years. Some funds have a period of three years, you know, it's usually between three or four years. Now, after that period, the fund can only make follow-on investments in existing companies. It cannot make new investments in new companies. And that's why usually after this period, um, most VC firms will have had another fund raised so that they can continue to invest in new companies. Okay. Um, and um, you know, lastly, uh, on this page, each fund tends to have some type of fund strategy. It could be uh, investing in a particular life cycle stage, seed stage, you know, um, series A, series B, growth stage, um, it could be a strategy around a particular geography. So for example, a lot of the um, funds based in Australia predominantly or some only invest in Australia or Australia, New Zealand. Um, our strategy is to invest across Southeast Asia, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and most funds have certain themes or focus areas that they invest in. So we invest in B2B um, data, SaaS, AI, uh, and some funds, you know, uh, uh, have quite broad remits. They'll invest in, you know, uh, anything uh, within technology, uh, some focus on um, uh, ag, of course, some focus on biotech, some focus on medtech, so on and so forth. You, you get the drift. And so what does this all mean? <laughs> What's the so what? The so what here is that, you know, um, it's worthwhile finding out, um, you know, where a fund is in its fund horizon, what does the, fu the fund invest in, what does it allocate in terms of new investment versus follow on investment, you know, all these sort of details of, of, of a fund, it's worthwhile doing your research and finding out whether online or through your initial conversations with the fund, just to see, you know, it, whether all of these variables could fit. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, a lot of this is actually online these days, but um, you'll be able to find out quite quickly through your first interactions with any you know, VC firm. All right. Okay. Now, I've talked a bit about, you know, Series A, Series B, um, Seed. What does it all mean? And um, I don't think there's any strict definition, but the, this chart hopefully gives you a guideline of, you know, what, um, what this all means, at least what it means to us. <laughs> Uh, when we talk about early seed within our firm, we're talking about, you know, really um, uh, accelerator stage uh, companies. It's uh, either it's uh, a concept or really rough, you know, uh, prototype MVP uh, or, you know, MVP is not even built yet, uh, but there's some validation work that's, uh, that's happened um, to test, you know, the, the hypothesis. 
Um, so yeah, you know, that's sort of usually about 20K to 100, 200K. That's usually that type of, you know, uh, life cycle stage, super, super uh, early, uh, may not have something quite there yet, but, you know, there are the, uh, uh, you know, conceptual elements of what, um, what you're looking to build. Late seed stage is typically, you know, sort of post accelerator, if you will, um, uh, raising a, a million, sometimes up to even $3 million. And the focus on this stage is, you know, uh, the, the MVP is done, there's some early traction, but you, you're still sort of iterating, you're still trying to find and prove product market fit. There's still a lot of experimentation going on. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, what you're looking to do here is, you know, get to a point where you can prove out um, quite clearly that there is product market fit. And that is um, uh, leading us to Series A. And Series A is where our firm um, uh, invests. It's usually around in, uh, in this region of about, you know, 5 million, there or thereabouts on the very high end, 20 million, but typically more like 5 million, 6 million for an Australian um, Series A. Um, and at this stage, what we're looking for is quite clear signs of product market fit, that what has been built is something that customers want to use, buy, pay for, um, and that there is a uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there are clear signals around this. And so, you know, typically the raise at this point in time is to then start to accelerate scaling or initial scaling of the company because that product market fit has been, you know, has been established. Now, that scaling may not be efficient, um, not quite yet, but, you know, the business is ready for scaling. Um, and Series B uh, is another life cycle stage where, where we invest. And at Series B, what we're looking for and what we're trying to pro provide capital to do uh, are for those companies to really accelerate their scaling. Um, and we're looking for you know, efficient methods of scaling so that we can really you know, uh, uh, drive that scaling through the deployment of additional capital. And so that scaling might be uh, across multiple markets at the same time. It might be across you know, a range of different product extensions or adjacencies. Uh, it might be... Uh, um, uh, entering into, you know, slightly new spaces, building upon the core that's already there, uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, uh, um, uh, it goes from you know, conceptual and very early ideas, uh, MVP, but, you know, haven't proven out product market fit, Series A product market fit being uh, shown and then some initial scale and then Series B and from there on in really looking to accelerate scale in many ways, whether it's uh, product or distribution, um, you know, uh, other forms of growth were geographic or uh, different segments, so on and so forth. Then Series C and D and E and F and <laughs> uh, whatever it might go to if the company says uh, private is really, you know, putting uh, into place um, uh, further growth and infrastructure to eventually, eventually um, IPO. That's typically been the case. It's becoming, you know, uh, more prevalent for, for companies to say private, you know, over the last you know, five years or so. Um, but typically at some point in time, they will eventually become uh, ideally uh, uh, you know, either acquired or you know, publicly listed companies. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, you know, from a guideline perspective, what all of these things mean, right? Um, series A, Series B, Series C. And you can see on the left-hand side there, you know, on the axis, the, the typical scale of the, um, uh, the range of um, capital raise sizes. So, you know, a, a Series B in Australia is typically somewhere between 10 to $20 uh, million. Sometimes it goes up as high as $50 million. I've seen it even higher than that, but usually it's $10 to $20 million. Um, and then Series C, D, uh, you know, it might be, you know, uh, much more than that. Uh, our firm was involved in a, a Series C recently that was $100 million, uh, in, in size, and that was an Australian company. So, um, hopefully useful and hopefully a guideline here that you can help to get a sense of what investors mean when they say series A, series B, series C, and so on. Cool. Okay. So just to recap a little bit, okay. Most VCs invest in some type of using some type of strategy. Uh, it could be a, a strategy in relation to geography. So for example, in Australia, there is a scheme called the, uh, early stage venture capital limited partnerships scheme. And um, this scheme provides tax incentives to stimulate uh, investment in the venture capital sector. So if you're a, an investor in a, um, 
uh, ESV CLP listed um, a VC firm, you have a different or preferential tax treatment on the um, returns that are provided by that fund. Okay, and so um, the uh, the requirement though on the fund funds side is that they will have to deploy at least 80% of their capital into Australian domiciled companies, Australian domiciled businesses. And so um, uh, that's important to note because if you're a, an Asian company trying to raise from an Australian venture capital firm, um, you know, uh, it might be more difficult to do so because they have some restrictions on how they deploy their capital. Um, just as an example. And so geography is important to note so that you're raising from <laughs> the right firms that can invest in your, in your company. Uh, our firm is domiciled in Singapore, so we don't have those restrictions, but you know, each geography, each, uh, um, each firm where it's domiciled will have its own um, uh, compliance requirements, legal requirements, tax related requirements in terms of where they're able to invest or where they focus their investments on. So it's worthwhile noting that. As I mentioned before, um, VC firms tend to uh, focus on specific industries or themes. And our firm invests in B2B, SaaS, data, AI. That's our, that's our sweet spot. Uh, other firms might focus on consumer businesses, might focus on social, might focus on e-commerce, for example. So it's worthwhile finding out these things. And the best online resource that I found for Australia is uh, on the uh, Airtree um, uh, website. Airtree is one of the leading VC firms in, in Australia. Uh, and uh, they have this uh, wonderful sort of uh, community uh, maintained um, uh, list, uh, which has, you know, I'm pretty sure all of the VC firms in Australia, how to contact them, what they invest in, what the fund size is. Um, and so it's worthwhile checking that out. But there are other sources as well. And you should, you know, you can check out Crunchbase. Um, which is a part of TechCrunch or CB Insights, another wonderful um, source. Um, and the so what of this is, is that you, you should do your research. <laughs> you should do your research so that you're reaching out to relevant VC firms. Um, you know, there's no point reaching out to uh, a firm that doesn't invest in, uh, for example, ad companies, <laughs> uh, right? So do your research, make sure you're reaching out to the relevant firms and, you know, I've, I've noticed that um, VC firms, and, and, and uh, I include us in this as well, is that we, we, we tend to, our investment thesis tends to change and shift over time. Um, so for example, uh, uh, maybe, you know, um, uh, using Blackbird uh, Ventures as an example, you know, I think when uh, Blackbird started, you know, a lot of the investments were very much SaaS um, uh, investments, but then, uh, uh, they started to include hardware investments and investments in space and in, um, you know, plant-based, um, uh, you know, meat and, and, and those sorts of things while still investing in SaaS along the way. So, um, uh, and for us, for, for example, you know, we, we, we very much started in, um, uh, uh, in, in sort of Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand from a geographic perspective, but, you know, uh, we started to make some investments in Europe as well, uh, right? So, um, you know, the strategy of um, VC firms tends to shift and change slightly over time. And so I found that the best source of truth is, you know, just to look at the entire list and the timeline of what that firm has invested in over time. And you'll see how that has shifted and changed and you'll get a better sense of, you know, what it is that the team is looking for at this you know, point in time, you know, look over the last sort of 12 months, what, what has the firm been, um, been focusing on? And that's usually the best source of truth, apart from asking them yourself, of course, when you get the chance to um, have a meeting with one of the VC firms. But that's a so what, right? Do your research, find out and see, you know, see if you can find the VC firms that are relevant for the space that you're in. Okay, now what else do VCs do <laughs> with their time? Well, I can't speak for all VCs, but I can share with you what, what we do. And um, they're, they're really in these sort of four buckets. And let me take you through them. So the first thing that we do and what we spend, of course, a lot of time on is sourcing, which is, you know, um, meeting as many companies as we can, uh, meeting other investors, meeting with accelerator groups, ecosystem builders, universities. And uh, these are all very important sources of, you know, uh, 
meeting with potential investments for, for us. And of course, we have our own personal networks and relationships that we've built up over, uh, over many, many years. So sourcing is a very key component to what we do um, so that we have a, a great chance of seeing all the potential companies that we could uh, maybe invest in. Um, we also, of course, uh, have to invest the capital that's been raised from investors. So we source the different you know, uh, companies and then we invest in some of those companies. And to give you a sense of the, uh, <laughs> the ratio, uh, we see roughly 500 uh, companies a year, uh, uh, roughly, um, and uh, across our entire team, which is about 10, you know, 10 people. Uh, and uh, we've been around for you know, five plus years now. And in those five plus years, we've made, and I think we're closing our investment number 28 at the moment. So the, you know, the, you know, we've seen more than 2,500 companies and we've invested in 28 or so. Um, so you know, that's, a, that's a ratio for us. Other firms, it might be different. I know that some of the large Australian VC firms are probably seeing you know, something like 1,000, 1,500 companies a year across their entire team. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's why it's so important to do your research and make sure you're relevant, right? As you approach a, a, a VC firm. Okay, in any case, we invest the capital raised from investors, right? So we're assessing those in, uh, investment opportunities, making those investments. And then when there's a chance to exit at a profit by selling our shareholding in whatever way it might happen, as I mentioned earlier, that's what we do. Uh, of course, we support those portfolio companies after investment. We provide you know, strategic advice, we sit on the boards. Um, there might be ways for us to help share operational experience amongst the different teams. Uh, we um, make introductions to them in terms of partnerships, in terms of new customers and clients. Um, uh, I'm involved quite a lot in uh, helping to you know, find talent uh, for our portfolio companies, right? helping them to raise additional capital for subsequent rounds. Um, uh, uh, helping them with strategy, helping them with um, geographic you know, growth and helping them with uh, various board matters like um, you know, uh, uh, C-level compensation, sales team um, uh, compensation structures, uh, uh, share option plans, all of these sorts of things that are all, you know, um, uh, all those sort of board level uh, discussions, uh, we're a part of those discussions. Um, and then lastly, of course, we, we, we're we networking, we're providing mentorship, we're connecting startups to relevant parties, even if it's not an investment opportunity for us. And we're sharing information, just like I'm sharing this information with you right now to help build the ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, we want um, founders to be as well-educated on this quite opaque process, um, <laughs> as well-educated as possible. And we're trying to do our bit to, to help that. So these are the key things that, um, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, onto the investment process. So the investment process itself from the first day of meeting a venture capital firm to the, you know, or venture capital firms, <laughs> uh, to the, the day that the um, uh, investment process closes, typically I would say it's about, it's about 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, there or thereabouts. It's a typically a roughly a three month process, but you want to give yourself a bit of buffer. And so uh, I would say that you know, uh, uh, and this is for later stage companies. I know that most of the companies you know watching this uh, right now are early stage. But you know, if you're a later stage company and you've got let's say you know eighteen months worth of runway, you you may want to start your capital raise in or around the twelve month mark so that you've got some buffer. Uh, in relation to you know, uh, capital for the company whilst you're doing your, your capital raise. So you sort of give yourself six months, but you know, hopefully it closes within, let's say 10 to 12 weeks or some, somewhere within the three month mark. Now, sometimes these capital raises can go quite quickly. Sometimes it can be a two month process, but usually I've, I've, I've seen it to take you know, roughly three months or so. And so what are the steps? And I've sort of rolled up the steps here, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, relatively simply here, but essentially for a VC firm, the steps are, you know, first of all, you're sourcing, you're seeing a whole universe of companies and they, you know, either you're reaching out to them or they're reaching out to you. Um, there's some sort of initial filtering, um, whether it fits your investment thesis, whether it fits what you're looking for as a VC um, firm. Um, and then there is a, a an assessment of the company, you know, where does it fit from a competitive standpoint? You know, um, uh, what is the nature of the product? You know, how do the team build product? 
Um, how does the team think about the space that they're in? What is the vision for the company? You know, all these sorts of things are assessed by the VC firm. And, you know, if there is alignment there uh, and if the, the, the VC firm really, you know, is bought into what the company, what the founders are doing, um, then they would issue a term sheet. And the term sheet is basically a summary of the contract for investment. And after that term sheet has been agreed, usually there's a, a period of uh, due diligence and due diligence is when you're looking at you know, uh, uh, the legal aspects of the company, more technical aspects of the company, certain financial aspects of the company um, uh, before closing the deal. And then after the deal is closed, um, the VC firm would then start to help in uh, whatever way that it can and be a part of the board, um, start to make introductions, all those sorts of things. And then, of course, eventually, eventually in years to come, five, six, seven, eight years, usually, <laughs> uh, and it's actually getting longer and longer, there is some form of exit from the company. So that's really in the investment process from beginning to end. And so, you know, uh, from... Uh, you know, the first meeting uh, or first starting a, uh, a capital raise process and then closing, you know, uh, let's say from steps, uh, let's imagine that the first meeting is step, you know, step one or two through to step six. That's usually a roughly a three month process. Okay, so what do we look at? I mentioned this a little bit before. So pre-term sheet, before a term sheet is issued, the, the aspects of a company that our firm tends to focus on, remember we invest at what is known as Series A and Series B. So it's a, a little bit later than, than, than seed stage. We look at um, a few key areas. We look at the team, of course, and different aspects of the team. And when I talk about team, you know, what are the things we're looking at? We're looking at um, the experience and skill sets of the team, uh, what the team have been able to do so far in terms of execution and traction, we're looking at, you know, um, or trying to form a, form a view on their ethics and their transparency because we're going to be working with, you know, these folks for the next six, seven, eight years. Um, their openness for our input, which doesn't mean to say that they should listen to everything that we <laughs> that we say or tell them to do, but are they open to considering our thoughts and feedback? Um, how disciplined the management team is in running an actual business uh, and, and not just, you know, uh, focusing on one thing like. Uh, uh, I don't know, the technology side of things, but, you know, uh, the, the, the business overall. And can we get a sense of, you know, the perseverance of the team, the agility of the team? Um, you know, we also have to be brought into the vision of the, uh, of the company. I mean, these, these are the aspects that are all really important to us as we evaluate the, the team. Can the, you know, can the CEO, can the founders bring on board other really high quality folks along the journey to help them grow the company? We're looking at all of those aspects. So that's team. We're looking at the market potential of the business. You know, um, uh, how does the um, business compare to other competitors? Uh, what is the landscape like? Um, uh, is it in a uh, an industry that is has already consolidated, which makes competition really expensive, or is it in a really nascent space where a lot of education is required in order to you know gain traction with um, uh, with customers? We try to form a view on these aspects of the market. Of course, we're looking for some form of differentiation, some form of competitive advantage, something that's different and special about what the company is building or how it's building or what, you know, or, or how it's doing what it's doing, such that it stands out from its competitors. And what could that be? So we're trying to get a sense of what that differentiation is. Um, uh, point number four here is uh, around traction. So, you know, how much traction has the team achieved to date? What have they been able to do with the resources that they have had so far? Um, and we tend to focus on these sort of um, top four uh, areas, you know, team, market potential, competitive advantage, traction. Um, we tend to focus on that much more, but we also look at what is the potential path to profitability over the next few years. We don't have to you know, be investing in companies that are already profitable, but we want to get a sense that eventually, you know, the unit economics make it possible for the company to be a profitable one. Um, also, what could the investment terms be? And then lastly, what is the exit potential for this business? Is it more likely to be a business that is going to be acquired or could it list? Or, you know, you know what are those exits, potential exit scenarios? And we sp tend to spend a lot less time on these sort of aspects. They're much more amorphous and spend a lot more time on team, you know, product, right? market potential, uh, differentiation, traction, those are the areas that we tend to spend much, much more time on. Now, um, uh, let's say we have uh, aligned on all of those things, we've issued a term sheet, 
uh, and then we've done our uh, due diligence, you know, uh, all of that work ends up in what is known, at least in our firm, as an investment committee memorandum. Uh, and the topics of that investment committee memorandum, the table of contents I've just provided here on the, on the screen. So, you know, uh, what is an overview of the company? Why are we investing? Um, you know, uh, describing the product, what it does, um, how, how does the business make money? How does it price its product? Um, what is the competitive landscape? What does it look like? Traction, financials, technology, legals, the team, investment terms. So, I mean, all of the things that we've collated in terms of um, the company and our assessment of the company to date all gets put into a, um, a paper, a document, uh, which then goes through an investment committee and then we, we vote and, uh, you know, we, we, we vote to proceed with the investment or not. And by the time that we've done this work, essentially, you know, we, <laughs> we, will, be making the, we will be making the investment. But these are really the, the, the key reasons why we're making the investment and, you know, an overview and, and an understanding of the company. And we want to understand the companies that we invest in deeply um, uh, so that we are very clear in what we're investing in, but also, you know, so that we can uh, provide meaningful uh, help um, with the right context in relation to, to the company. Now, uh, I'm gonna talk you through a typical investor presentation template. And what you're going to notice is that there's quite a strong correlation between you know, what you include in an investor presentation and what the investor will eventually include <laughs> at least in some way, shape or form in their own internal investment paper. There's, you know, there's probably a, a, a very strong, almost one-to-one -one mapping <laughs> between the two. And the template that I'm going to talk you through is a template that is um, on the Sequoia Capital uh, website. Sequoia Capital is one of the, um, the oldest and one of the largest VC firms in the world. Uh, and you know they have funds based in the US and in India and in China, uh, and uh, you know it's a, a very well regarded and, and, and renowned uh, venture capital firm. And this template comes from their website, so you know um, please feel free to go to their website to, to take a look. But uh, these are the key topics, and I'm just going to talk you you through them. So you know what is the company purpose? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? I'm sure you've heard most of this before. What is your company solution, and what makes it different? Um, why now? Why is now a good time? What's been evolving in relation to um, your particular space that makes now a great time to be um, launching this company? Um, what is the market size? Is it a large enough problem? Um, what's the nature of the competition? What's the nature of your own product? Um, what is the business model? How are you going to price what you're selling? Uh, how are you going to make money? The team, of course, which is very important and, you know, can you can include your founders, but also other key members of the team and, and from time to time, even, you know, uh, members of your board. Um, and then lastly, the uh, financial aspects of the company. You know, how much are you looking to, what is the financial state of the company at the moment? How much are you looking to raise? How are you going to deploy the capital that you're raising? Okay, so uh, that was a very quick rundown only because I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure, you know, you've seen these sort of investment templates before and I'd encourage you to just go to the Sequoia site and you can just read through it there. And there are a bunch of, um, you know, great templates uh, online, but typically has that, that flow. Now, there are other useful documents that, um, you, that are worthwhile preparing as you're entering a capital raise. And so um, uh, the first one is um, a one to two page teaser or summary that you would send as a part of the first introduction to a venture capital firm. And the reason why this is really helpful is because if I receive one of these um, uh, you know, summary documents, I call them one pages, if I receive a one pager and um, the opportunity isn't really relevant for our investment strategy and our, or what they call the investment thesis, uh, I could then forward that one pager to another VC firm where it could be relevant for them. And so, and if they're open to connecting, they'll say, great, this looks interesting to us. This kind of fits what we're looking for. I'd love to be connected with the founder. And so it's worth your while to, you know, um, put together this sort of one or two pager, uh, which is a summary that you can then use as a part of your own qualifying process in relation to, you know, approaching a VC firm. But if it's not relevant for them, they can then use that to then, you know, hopefully make an introduction to another VC firm. And the way that investor introductions work is um, they do what is known as a two-sided introduction, which means that they will forward, you know, your investor presentation, or sometimes it's just a written blurb to the other VC firm. And if that VC firm opts in by saying, 
yes, I'm interested in, in meeting with the founder and, and finding more about this, then, then they'll make the introduction so that there's some level of interest already on both sides to connect. And that's known as the two-sided introduction. That's how VC firms introduce companies to each other. So prepare that one to two page teaser because it could be helpful to, you know, uh, make your capital raise more well-known amongst um, relevant investors. Um, the second point is that, you know, at some point in time, you're going to have at least some level of financial model that you'll need to go through with the, um, with the investor. The investor wants to know how you're going to spend your capital. Uh, and of course, you know, early, early on, there's zero revenue. So, <laughs> well, typically anyway. And so the focus is more on, you know, how you intend to spend um, the capital to build the company or build the product. Um, but it's good to, be, to have at least some level of financial model early stage companies will have less sophisticated financial models. Later stage companies will have much more sophisticated financial models because they'll have a wealth of data and experience and um, traction from which, you know, they can leverage in building their financial model. But at some point in time, you have to have an explanation of how you're going to, you know, how you're going to spend that capital. Um, the third thing here, the data room, this is typically more for slightly later stage companies. So seed stage companies tend not to have so much of a, a data room as such, um, but I've got a link here, and um, there is a um, you know there's a great post online um, uh, of um, you know what should be included in a data room, but it typically includes you know, things like incorporation documents, um, key contracts, employee contracts. I mean, all those sort of things that uh, a VC firm would need to go through from a due diligence process. And uh, uh, as I said, for seed stage companies, it's less relevant, but for um, but for later stage companies, it's, it ends up being quite a few documents. And so preparing that ahead of the uh, start of the capital raise just means that once you're in the capital raise, you're not scrambling to get information for uh, any VC firms that would be interested to get to that stage of the discussion. Um, point four here uh, is documents of incorporation. You need to be incorporated. Otherwise, <laughs> there's no company to invest in. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, uh, I highly recommend for you all to read um, uh, a book called Venture Deals by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson. I think it's in its third or fourth edition now. Uh, and, you know, um, it's a wonderful um, uh, explanation of all of the key terms um, when you're raising from a VC firm. So uh, it'll explain to you in, from a founder's perspective and in uh, relatively straightforward layman's terms, what all the various clauses mean and how important they are and how, uh, and how they work. And so I highly recommend for you to read this book. It's a relatively short read, but um, uh, very, very helpful. Um, okay, so what does this all mean? What's the so what here? The so what here is, um, first of all, understand how investor introductions work, the two-sided introduction. Um, understand that, you know, um, uh, uh, there are some processes here that are quite asynchronous and so best to be uh, prepared ahead of time uh, and then you know you don't have to scramble in case you, know, you get quickly to a, um, a diligence discussion or the VC firm needs more details and so you can provide them access to a data room quite quickly and I guess <laughs> the third point here is it's never really like in the movies it's not like you know uh, uh, you're presenting in in front of a dragon's den and they're giving you a scorecard <laughs> at the end of, at the end of the presentation. They're going to invest your know, thumbs up or thumbs down. It's not really how it works. These are more asynchronous conversations that evolve over time, and there are certain materials that can help with the whole process of that conversation. And you kind of treat it more like a sales funnel, if anything, you know, and you're qualifying along the way. And some of these materials and information, you know, hopefully will help you uh, along the way. <laughs> Okay, all right. Uh, and we're going to end off now with some useful tips and tricks. They're not really tricks as such. They're just really some tips from, you know, um, what I've noticed you know, working in this space for the last, you know, 10 years or so. Um, so um, uh, firstly, you know, as you're going through the process of validating your concept, your business, your idea, seek feedback from customers, friends, mentors, and not just investors, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, investors play one part in the whole sort of uh, ecosystem. They have a role to play, um, but they're not, you know, 
geniuses or you know uh, <laughs> savants or, or anything like that <laughs> some may be but i'm not <laughs> in any case you know um they have a role to play but you know there, there's no point sort of treating what the investor provides you as feedback as gospel right um have a broad set of um uh um you know sources from which you can seek relevant feedback for what you're doing and the best feedback i think comes from customers um, if you're going to embark on an investment you know capital raising process make sure you're prepared make sure that you have you know uh, prepared those documents that were mentioned um, previously make sure that you have conducted your research on that you know on the vc firms that you want to reach out to so that you've got a, a list of the ones that are relevant to the life cycle stage and the space that you're in and so that when you reach out to them, it's relevant for them. Um, uh, I did mention that, you know, we see roughly 500 uh, companies uh, a year uh, and uh, many other VC firms would see, would see more than that. Um, and so where it's possible, see if you can seek a warm introduction into that VC firm. I know it's a bit of a cliche now, but, you know, I, I think it does work uh, and just to sort of bump you up on top of that list and get you, you know, sort of on top of that uh, long email list that, uh, you know, uh, of all the, the different entrepreneurs and founders reaching out to VC firms. Um, uh, I mentioned this just, just now, but treat the process like a sales funnel, you know, make sure you plan it through and you're methodical about, you know, the sales funnel and the process, you know, from first meeting to, you know, uh, deeper conversations to, hopefully some sort of term sheet or sharing some information then landing on some sort of term sheet, then diligence. It's all a part of a sales process in the sales funnel that you, you know, may be used to in terms of your own business. And I'd encourage you to really treat it that way. Um, remember that you're going to need to work with this investor for at least the next five years. And that's if things go well. So, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. So you're assessing them as much as they're assessing you. Is this someone or is this a firm that I'd like to work with for that period of time? Are my values aligned with the values of, you know, this firm? Um, and so I'd encourage you to ask the VC, um, you know, partners or associates or whoever it might be that you're talking, ask them questions as well and see if the fit could be there. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a conversation. It's not just an interview, right? And the conversation should go both ways. Um, I'd encourage you to keep the terms simple and straightforward because if you get into really complex terms early on, particularly early on, that tends to get even more complex as the business gets older and as it progresses. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, try not to be too disheartened by no's. If you're reaching out to 20, 30, 40 venture capital firms, you're going to be hearing likely a lot of no's. And that's a part of the process. And that's uh, unfortunately the way that the process works. Um, and so, you know, uh, try to see it as more of a matter of fit rather than a matter of, you know, worth, right? Um, and that's how I look at it when I'm looking at um, investment opportunities. Does this fit with what we're trying to do? Does this fit with our investment strategy, our investment thesis? Does this fit in terms of, you know, how we're, you know, uh, the, the types of companies that we're looking to invest in and the types of founders that we can work with and the types of spaces that we want to involve, be want to involved in and, and life cycle. And there's so many different factors. And so does it fit? And, so, and, and after looking at, you know, over the last five years, more than, you know, two and a half thousand companies, we've made 28 investments. I mean, it's a really, you know, um, low rate. It's, uh, I, I wish it was more, but it just happens to be that that's how it's worked out. Other firms might have different, you know, um, uh, 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 investment ratios, but I think they're, we're all roughly in line with each other. Uh, so um, try not to be disheartened by that. All it takes is one or two yeses um, out of all of those no's. And if you can, um, see if you can seek feedback um, without being defensive, just with a sense of curiosity, understanding, okay, well, you know, uh, fully understand, um, but, you know, really curious and wondering, you know, uh, where the fit, you know, uh, wasn't there, uh, what could it be and what feedback could you give me? And um, I tend to, you know, um, be very open and, and, and happy to share that feedback if, if, the, if the founders uh, ask for it. So, um, you know, I, I'd encourage you to, uh, you know, to be open to that feedback and, and you know, uh, listen to it and, and uh, see if you can see any consistent patterns amongst different types of feedback that you receive from different investors.
So <laughs> I know that was a lot to take in, but hopefully that gives you a good overview of the capital raising process. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit more of what happens on the VC firm side so that you can see what's happening on the other end as you go through the um, investment process and capital raising process um, itself. I, I hope you've found um, this session useful. Um, and uh, you know, I hope that uh, uh, this has lifted the veil a little bit in relation to what tends to be a relatively opaque process. I do encourage you to do a few things uh, just to close off. Uh, make sure you do your research. Make sure you give yourself plenty of time to raise that capital. Make sure that you know um, you have in your mind that uh, even though there could be a lot of no's as a part of the process, trying not to be disheartened by that and keep on going until you find you know um, those yeses, those true believers. Um, and um, you know, uh, big tip is to <laughs> read Venture Deals by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson, uh, a really, really helpful book if you're embarking on the capital raising process. Hope that was helpful for you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.